Hello everyone. I hope you are doing well. In the last video, I announced that I would do a Q&A video to celebrate 10,000 subscribers and ask the community to post their questions in the comments. To add to it, I will post Q&A videos once a month from now on. The reason here is very simple. I did like to create a dialogue instead of a monologue. So far, I have received some very interesting questions and I'd like to answer some of them today. By the way, the nature of some of the questions make it very hard to explain them in one or two sentences. Again, in order to make the content organized and comprehensible, I will do my best to give a well-structured answer by introducing their necessary background information, so that you will have a more systematic understanding. However, I have to point out a potential issue caused by linguistic misunderstanding between you and myself in understanding your question and providing my answer. If it is the case, I apologize in advance. In Chinese, there is a popular proverb to express the importance of knowing different sources of knowledge. This proverb is Kai Juan Yu Yi, which translates to it is beneficial to open a book. Of course, here I'm using a video format, but I consider it to be a book in a modern style. So, let's get started. The first question today is from Mr. Thomas Hudczek from Vienna, Austria. He asked about my understanding and the practice of Heng Ha Sound in the internal style martial art. He said, For the question and answer section, I would love to hear about your understanding and the practice of the Heng Ha Sound in the internal martial art styles. Does that mean that you always inhale through the mouth while saying Hung? See you soon, bad regards. And uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Hudachaks, for suggesting such a good question. To answer this question well, first let me show you what Hung and Ha sound like in practice. Okay, let me demonstrate the Hung sound and the Ha sound separately. The first one I'd like to demonstrate the Hang sound. It is a shorter, faster energy releasing movement. I think I can use I can demonstrate this with the Xing Yi Pi Quan Fa Jin exercise. Okay? So like here. Right? Very short and fast. Right, first. To the ha sound, I would like to use the Tai Chi, Chen Style Tai Chi, Yan Shou Hong Chui, the punch, the last movement. Of that form, the punching motion. So here, one, then one, so one. It is a comparatively longer movement. Okay, longer energy releasing movement. Now that you know what they sound like, I'd like to talk about the background of the term the practical application of this term and other necessary related topics. Before I start to introduce this term, let me first explain the question itself to those who are not familiar with this term. What Mr. Hudachest referred to as Heng Ha Sound is called Heng Ha Er Qi or Heng Ha Two Energy in Mandarin. You may have uh, often noticed in many martial art movies, especially the ones Shaolin styles. Very often, the actors would make an audible sound while exhaling from the mouth during fighting. That can be considered a very basic demonstration of Heng Ha Er Qi, but it's not that simple in practice. So, where do these two sounds come from? Did this term or the two sounds originate in the martial art community? The answer is no. In Chinese Buddhism, 
There are two important figures who are responsible for gardening the temple's entrance. Very often, you would see them at the entrance of a temple since they are considered a pair of powerful gods. In the 16th century, during the Ming Dynasty, a very popular vernacular novel named Feng Shen Yan Yi or The Investure of the God was published. Feng Shen Yan Yi is a literary work combining elements of uh, history, folklore, mythology, legends, and uh, fantasy. This book consists of 100 chapters and became very popular after publication. In this book, there are two main characters relevant to the topic of this question. Those are Zheng Lun and Chen Qi. Zheng Lun is also called Heng Jiang or General Heng, and Chen Qi is also called Ha Jiang or General Ha. Both of them are officials of gardening the granary of the Shang Dynasty. In that novel, they finally became gods. Those two figures have special abilities. For example, Heng is shown with his mouth closed, pronouncing the word Heng, and Ha is shown with his mouth wide open, pronouncing the word Ha. Those two sounds represent the beginning and the end of the birth and the death of all the things. Heng is able to capture the sounds of his enemies by making the Heng sound and exhaling white beams from his nose. And Ha is able to do the same by saying Ha and exhaling yellow gas from his mouth. With that, two prominent Buddhist figures became two killers in China with their special abilities using the sounds of Heng and Ha. According to written records, this term was first used in Tai Chi documents such as Tai Chi Quan Pu Shi Yi, which translated to Tai Chi Quan Classic Explanation. This document was published by Yao Fuchun and Jiang Rongqiao in 1930, but the article was actually written about 300 years ago. In that article, there, there were six Tai Chi poems. In poem number three, there is these lines, Na zhu dan tian lian nei gong, heng ha er qi miao wu qiong which translated to hold the energy in the Dan Tian and apply the two energies of Heng and Ha in martial art. By the way, since there is no clear record about the author of this article, different Tai Chi schools claim their own ancestors to be the original author. But anyway, because of this poem, we can infer that it is from Tai Chi that people started to use the term Heng and Ha in martial art practice. So, what are Heng and Ha? Well, simply speaking, there are the audible breathing sound in martial art practice that people use sound to strengthen the body structure and the power. Very often, this technique is used in Fali practice. To get a better understanding of Heng and Ha, we have to talk about another famous style which is Ba Ji. Ba Ji uses the term Xing Qi, means quickly exhale from the nose. Sometimes, practitioners in Ba Ji school use Heng Ha as well as these two terms are. Very often, interchangeable in theory. Many years ago, I met Huo Wenxue in Tianjin to ask questions about Ba Ji from him. Huo is the grandson of Huo Diange, one of the best Ba Ji masters in history and also the bodyguard of the last emperor in the Qing dynasty. 
who are demonstrated the Xing Qi practice for me and my understanding even to this day is that it is the same as Heng Ha in Tai Chi practice. Now, what is the difference between Heng and Ha? Well, the Heng sound is used when the sound is short and the body movement is comparatively smaller. In a situation, you only exhale through the nose or even just hold the breath in situations like Fa Jin practice. The Ha sound is longer and the body movement is comparatively larger. In this situation, you can exhale not only through the nose but also partly from the mouth. So, the choice of application of these two sounds relies on the speed of the body movement and the breathing action. Again, Heng Ha Er Qi is about the result of the coordination between body movement in Fa Li and the required breathing patterns. Then, you may ask me which one between Heng and Ha is more frequently used in martial art practice. In my opinion, the Heng sound is used much more often than the Ha sound, especially in the internal styles. We emphasize the short force in Fa Li. Therefore, Heng sound which is used in short force movement, of course, is more important and thus more frequently used. Be careful here to not imitate the sound used in Kung Fu movie. Those sounds are mostly fake sound, possibly created by special sound effects in movie studios. Not that at all the real sound created naturally in martial practice. This is my explanation of the Heng and Ha sounds. Sure, it is only a brief introduction, but I hope this gives you a good idea of the concept and its implication. I will post more content in the future whenever I find the opportunity, but for now, let's move on to the next question. The next question is from Mr. Greg Barnsdale. He has asked about my views on the use of power training or cross training such as body weight exercise, weights, uh, kettlebells, iron poles, and other such equipment. He also mentioned my teacher, Master Ma Hong's videos where he goes through some equipment training relevant to Chen style Tai Chi. Thank you, Greg. This is a good question. Traditionally, there are many training sections using different equipment. In my first Decoding Martial Proverbs series video, I introduced the importance of Gong Li practice. Today, I'd like to talk about this topic a bit further. There are two types of equipment training. The first type uses martial art weapons, such as spear, staff, saber, and so on. The spear is especially effective in power training. Also, martial weapons training can provide another benefit. Those weapons can be used in self-defense situation. Also, like I said in my prior video that the Chinese martial art originally focused on weapon training. The systematic bare hand training came much later. The Ming Dynasty, which existed about 600 years ago, was considered the best period in Chinese military development in terms of publications of some of the most important military and martial training manuals for both weapon and bare hand training. But even back then, weapons training dominated the content of any military documents. So, focusing on the weapon training can be very helpful in understanding the development of a Chinese martial art practice. The second type of training equipment consists of devices used only for power training. We did not have any gyms in China back when I was a kid. Many martial art teachers would train their students with equipment they designed themselves. 
Examples include the Shi Suo or stone lock, a very heavy guan dao, or big clay jars filled with sand, rubber band, and many others. This kind of equipment are only used to strengthen the body and develop martial force and power. In present-day China, the living conditions have changed dramatically in the last few decades. It is almost impossible for urban people to practice such an antique way of training anymore. However, new training equipment have been developed and adapted and in theory, they can provide similar if not exactly the same. I have seen some devices such as kettlebells and others which I do not know by name. So, as long as you are training your body for flexibility, speed, and force, and not for aesthetics such as bodybuildings, that will be fine. Training some muscle groups can improve flexibility and speed, which is more important in martial art practice than focusing on mainly on other type of muscle with body aesthetics in mind. Martial training is about function over form, even though there is a relationship between both. This is why when my student asks me which equipment should be used for training, I always ask about their objective first. To reiterate, any training method is fun as long as you focus on martial function and not body aesthetics. Greg, I hope that answers your questions. Let's check out the next question. The next question is from Fred Talk, who often posts good comments on the channel. I think it is just his internet name, but anyway, he has asked very good question in the past. But for today, let's focus on this one. He asked about the importance of visualizing the movement in the mind and the effect on actual performance. He said, could it be also interpreted outside of a physical practice like a visualization exercise where you imagine the movement like athletics do it do to increase performance when actually doing it? I believe any other in the community wonder about this as well. So, thank you Mr. Fred Talk for this question. A student of mine teaches mindfulness, and he mentioned to me how interesting and powerful the concept of mindfulness is, more than once. I'd like to talk about mindfulness briefly here. Nowadays, mindfulness is a very popular term in the West. In China, at least when I used to live there, we did not have this term mindfulness. Instead, there were many other similar terms used to describe the same practice, such as visualization. So, in martial art training, should you only visualize the movement to improve your martial performance? I, can, I cannot and do not claim to know what mindfulness is even though I practice and teach Xiu Dao which involves Dao's meditation and cultivation. But in my opinion, in martial art training, we should practice physically and at the same time visualize different aspects in order to optimize the effect and maximize the benefit. To tell you private information about myself, sometimes I visualize some Tai Chi movement while lying on bed. But I only do that when I have a hard time falling asleep. <laughs> I found it much more interesting than counting sheep. Normally, I fall asleep before finishing 30% of the Chen Cell Tai Chi routine. I suggest you try it out yourself and check how much of the routine you can cover before you fall asleep. Jokes apart, of course. Visualization appears to increase performance for some athletes according to some mindfulness experiments, but I still do not think it can replace physical practice. 
visualization can be good for mental aspect like awareness, but you still need physical practice to develop muscle memory. Different body actions will generate different benefit, and the benefit generated by our physical movements may have been underestimated just as the benefit of a practice of visualization are underestimated. So, my suggestion is that visualization can be of course be used, but only as a supplementary exercise to actual physical practice, not as a substitute. I believe it is the best way to optimize the practice. Friday talk, hope that answers your question. Do let me know if I misinterpreted it. So, the next question is from One Direction. Maybe they are a fan of the band by the same name. Anyway, One Direction suggested a couple of good questions. Let me read it first. Do you think most Bagua cells contain some Xing Yi or vice versa? I believe you once said that Xing Yi training produces stronger Fa Li in striking. Please explain how Xing Yi Fa Li differed from Ba Gua Fa Li or even Tai Chi Fa Li. Finally, please explain Fa Li versus Fa Jin. Thank you. To answer this question, let me first talk about a popular martial story involving Dong Hai Chuan, the most important Ba Gua disseminator and Guo Yunshen, a student of Li Luoneng, Li Luoneng the founder of Xing Yi. According to that story, Dong Hai Chuan and Li Luoneng met once met in Beijing. Dong and Guo tested each other's skill and finally realized that both cells can help each other. It is said that from then on, both Xing Yi and the Ba Gua school should learn from each other in practice. In my opinion, this is just a legendary story aimed at promoting friendliness between the Xing Yi and the Ba Gua schools with no historical basis. If it actually happened, it is very strange that no written record exists of their meeting and the subsequent decision. Also, no such written claims exist in any Xing Yi or Ba Gua document either. By the way, there is another version of this story that goes a step further by also including Yang Lu Chan, the founder of Yang Cell Tai Chi. But have you seen many Yang Cell Tai Chi practitioners also practice Xing Yi or Ba Gua? The answer is no. However, the lack of a written record cannot deny the benefit of cross-training. I have mentioned in prior videos that it is very hard for someone to practice one style at a high level due to the depth of each style. It is even more challenging to master two styles or more. Of course, it is a great idea to practice multiple styles. But Decades ago, martial art teachers were very conservative in teaching and not that open to cross training unless they themselves got the benefit from it. It is very unlikely for most people to practice more than one style, and this is also true based on my personal observation. Furthermore, if cross training was already a very popular approach to begin with, then many people would be practicing multiple styles at the same time and there would be no need to promote this concept. But the world is different today. We have the internet, we have a video, we largely have an open society in which many people are willing to share information and practicing more than one style is not only possible but it also beneficial and highly recommended so that a practitioner can reach a high level by focusing on the integration of multiple styles. Regarding the integration of both Xing Yi and Ba Gua, I believe 
Zhang Zhao Dong was the only one who successfully integrated both styles at once. I'm lucky enough to learn and practice Xing Yi Ba Gua Palm since Zhang Zhao Dong was my grandfather's teacher. At the same time, I practiced Chang style Ba Gua as well. However, I prefer to first teach my students Xing Yi and Ba Gua separately and teach them Xing Yi Ba Gua Palm only as an actual exercise later on. I want my students to learn the pure styles first, and only then move on to learning hybrid styles or integrating elements of one style into another. This is my approach. Once you have the pure basic right, the number of combination of movement and the patterns are endless, and you can design whatever suits your base on your physical structure and understanding. So, if you get the chance to learn more than one style, of course it is great. If not, please just focus on one style and keep your practice pure without adding any elements from other style. Once you reach a high level, feel free to integrate elements from other styles as a way to express your own understanding of martial art practice. As for the second question, Fa Li and Fa Jin are the same thing. They are interchangeable. The Fa Li skills achieved from practice of Xing Yi, Tai Chi, O Ba Gua are quite different in the beginning. For example, the commonly believed answer is that Tai Chi is more like spring force. Bagua is more of a striking force. Xing Yi is the combination of a striking and a sprint force. But at a high level, they should be the same. Ok, final question for today is from Dr. Avira. Actually, they asked me two questions. I think the first question has to be answered in a much more detailed approach, which I will save for another time. But I would like to talk about the second question first, since I often hear similar things and I would like to make my stance clear right away. Let me read the question for you first. I have another question. I'm an American that is fascinated by Chinese culture, martial art, and language. Other white American people have told me that. I wanting to gain this knowledge and practice this martial arts is racist and is cultural appropriation. I asked my friend that is Chinese and has only lived in America for six years if he thought it was wrong, and he said that racism does not apply to a man with a big heart. Is this how most Chinese people feel, or? Is this just his personal opinion? Also, what is your personal opinion? Okay. Well, I cannot really answer this question on behalf of anyone, but I can share with you some of my personal beliefs and understanding based on my experience regarding the term cultural appropriation. Originally, I was born and raised in China, but after I came to Canada, I had to study the local culture, which include speaking English and French, understanding local history, celebrating local holidays and festivals, eating local food, and dealing with local people. The list can go on and on, and all of them are related to culture, one way or another. So, am I partaking in culture? Uh, preparation? Well, not at all. If you ask me, I think I'm working on cultural appreciation, cultural adaptation, and cultural assimilation. It would be cultural preparation if I took credit from any of the things that were already a part of a Canadian culture, or if I claimed to be the custodian of a Canadian culture. If my contributions become part of a Canadian culture tomorrow, that would be great, 
but for now, I'm more than happy to just be a part of it. When I see someone speak a Chinese language, practice Chinese martial arts, and drink Chinese tea, I feel very happy about it. Of course, once in a while, I meet someone claiming to know Chinese culture more than Chinese people and that they are working hard to preserve Chinese culture for Chinese. Seriously, I have met these kind of people more than a couple of times in Canada, and each time I think it is a cultural ignorance, cultural arrogance, and to an extent, cultural appropriation as well. Fortunately, I have only met a few of these type of individuals in my 20 years of life experience in North America. So, I believe that for the most of the time, we are working on cultural appreciation. Regarding the claim that racism does not apply to a man with a big heart, well, in my opinion, it depends on what kind of heart it is. Ronald Reagan, one of the greatest presidents in US history, is highly regarded in my heart due to his economic and foreign policy. However, just recently, I watched a video that revealed that he made an unacceptable racist comments on African people in a conversation with Richard Nixon. Can we say that Reagan did not have a big heart? Of course not. So, no matter how big the heart is, people can still be racist if they choose to. To be fair to North America, there are a lot of racist people in China as well. In my opinion, racism is usually a product of the phenomenon of fear of the other. It's posture to people of different race and different cultures actually helps to cure racism. After moving to Canada, I have experienced racist action on a few occasions. For example, about 18 years ago, one of my neighbors took my cat away and sent it to the SPCA, the Animal Protection Agency in Canada. Later, she told me since she was worried about that I might eat my own cat, she took it away. In her own mind, she was rescuing the cat, believing that a Chinese man would eat his own cat. Again, this was a product of ignorance and the fear of others, and I have never judged local Canadians based on this isolated event. Anyway, Dr. Avira, let me ask you and also another white North Americans or people of any race that are worried about the term cultural appropriation. It is cultural appropriation to speak English if you are not from England. It is cultural appropriation to eat pizza if you are not from Italy. It is cultural appropriation to eat sushi if you are not from Japan. I believe everyone can answer this for themselves and decide how they want to live their lives. That concludes this Q&A video. Thank you once again for all the support and the feedback on the video so far. Can't wait to reach 15,000 subscribers. See you next time and enjoy your practice.